Good morning. It's a pleasure for me to present to you this morning on 20 years with Austell from the first human trial to a global standard. I was asked to uh, present to you this topic on establishing predictable surgical and restorative protocols through long-term tracking of ISQ data. As Vanden has very well covered with you, the initial protocol for os integration was a two-staged approach, whereby the implant that was placed is permitted to heal. And this healing period took a specific period of time, typically uh, not more than, rather not less than three months. But more recently, what we are seeing or uh, performing in our clinical practices is to not wait that minimum of three months and proceed with loading, oftentimes, as already was mentioned, early loading or possibly immediate loading. And so uh, I think that uh, Dr. Centerby's uh, concept of os integration being a continuum or a concept of stability is a good thought process to keep in mind when we're performing implant dentistry. Now, just eight years ago, we presented our first result as far as the use of the Ostel unit uh, to allow us to uh, predict, hopefully, the long-term success of the implant that we just placed. And I know that there's a lot of verbiage on here, so the important thing really is to understand the um, predictive value of that resonance frequency analysis. And the predictive value of when we perform a one-stage placement, which is to place the implant and connect a transmucosal attachment or connector to that implant versus two-staging, which is to bury the implant. We would also like to see the predictive value of RFA in selecting loading protocols. As you saw uh, with our previous speaker, uh, there are many studies going on that looks at early loading, uh, whereby the implant is uh, loaded with a prosthetic uh, uh, crown or restoration uh, after four to six weeks. And what we're really looking for is the cutoff value or the cutoff number that we see when we take our ISQ measurement. And so from that initial study, you can see uh, very clearly that depending on the loading protocol and depending on the placement protocol, we do see some significant uh, failures with a specific uh, approach. So when we looked uh, over eight years ago at the, the efficacy of using an ISQ number of 50 as the cutoff number, here are the results that we see as far as the uh, one stage versus two stage technique as well as immediate loading. When we look at these numbers specifically, what we're seeing is the fact that uh, with a two stage technique, uh, the success rates for those implants are very high compared to a one-stage technique uh, when the ISQ uh, measurements were below 50. However, uh, when we look at the uh, ISQ values above uh, 50, you can see that the results are far better from the standpoint of uh, traditional loading. Now that was reported uh, almost uh, five years ago uh, with the first uh, Ostel Symposium at the EAO. What we also reported on in 2008 using that same information was that the um, success rate of a one-stage implant with ISQ value of greater than uh, 50 at the time of placement was 97.8%. The success rate of a one-stage implant with ISQ value less than 50 
as you can see, was 82.4. So there was a statistical significance. Uh, success rate of two-stage implants with ISQ values less than 50 at time of placement was 100%, indicating to us that what Professor Bronemark initially recommended uh, was truly good for the implant and osseointegration, uh, even if the uh, stability of that implant at the time of placement was low. So interpreting this data, our recommendations at that time in 2008 was to uh, two-stage the implant, bury it or cover it uh, if the ISQ measurement was below 50. And if it was between 51 to 60, we would consider one-staging it by placing a healing abutment or a transmucosal abutment through the implant but not loading it. And if the ISQ value is higher than 61, we would consider immediate loading with a provisional restoration. Now again, that was in 2008, and to try to develop an algorithm for handling or managing immediately loaded implants, our thought was in the completely edentulous cases, because of the ability to use the provisional restoration to cross-arch splint or stabilize all implants, uh, we would be able to provide a um, fixed provisional restoration on those implants, regardless of the ISQ value. However, in the completely edentulous, if we are going to use the implants as a single unit, then it uh, it is determined by the ISQ value uh, that if it was below 50, we would two-stage it or bury the implant. And if it was greater than 50, we would connect some sort of attachment to those single individual units uh, to support an overdenture situation. In the partially dentated, uh, we, we came up with a different algorithm because, number one, oftentimes we do not have the capabilities of cross-arch stabilization. Uh, and many of our partially dentated patients received CT scans, and as you saw uh, with Professor Centerby's presentation, uh, there is a correlation between ISQ value and the Hounsfield's measurement uh, adjacent to the implant. Therefore, based on the CT scan measurements or as far as bone density, if the Hounsfield's units in the area where we were planning to place the implant was less than 500, and the ISQ value when the implant was seated was less than 45, uh, we would definitely two-stage that implant. If the Hounsfield's measurements were greater than 500 in the area where we were planning to place the implant, and we had variable ISQ values between 45 to 50, we would consider one staging or placing a transmucosal abutment. Finally, if the Hounsfield's unit measurements were greater than 500 and ISQ values greater than 50, uh, we would consider immediately prov provisionalizing that implant or implants with a provisional restoration. Finally, for a single missing tooth, Again, this was in 2008. Uh, oftentimes in the aesthetic zone, we would not uh, obtain a CT scan. Therefore, in, in that period, we would be looking at insertion torque. And again, trying to develop an algorithm by which we can uh, make clinical decisions, the insertion torque value, if it was less than 25, and the ISQ value was less than 45, that is, if it did not take a lot of torque to seat that implant, indicating that the bone site was uh, quite soft bone, we would two-stage that implant. If the insertion torque uh, was uh, uh, equal to 35 newtons centimeters and the ISQ value ranged from 45 to 50, uh, we would one-stage with a healing abutment. And if the insertion torque was greater than 35, an ISQ value greater than 50, again, we would consider immediate provisionalization. Now, selecting that uh, ISQ value of 50 as a cutoff value, what we were seeing were some is issues as far as uh, um, 
observing uh, some failures uh, with this algorithm. And as you can see, if we're not following that algorithm or protocol, uh, it results in a failure of the uh, immediate provisionalized implants. And to kind of um, give some credence to the recommendations that we've made, uh, we went back again to these CT scans and evaluated the uh, Hounsfield's measurements uh, with uh, where the implants were positioned. And again, similar to what Professor Senevi showed you, uh, we were able to identify the specific risk factors that were associated uh, with the implant that failed, and that is the Hounsfield's measurements uh, was quite low. Now, we received quite a bit of, uh, I wouldn't say criticism, but recommendations that it's not appropriate to just select a number uh, from the ISQ scale. And so what we did was we went back and looked at all of these uh, measurements and applied the um, equation for evaluating the sensi sensitivity and specificity uh, of these values. And as you can see, with any evaluation or exam, the sensitivity of that exam uh, includes all of the potential true values. But be, because of the all-inclusiveness of this evaluation, there are some false positives. Therefore, we should also apply an uh, equation for evaluating specificity where we would be able to rule out all of the false positive results, therefore uh, making the evaluation much more sensitive. So when we went back and look at these numbers as far as one staging versus two staging, again, the key areas that show up was that now instead of just handpicking uh, the value of uh, 50, uh, the equation looked at every single measurement. And so we were able to see that if values were less than uh, 55 as far as ISQ measurement compared to greater than 55, you see a significant improvement as far as uh, success rates for concern with these implants. And so back in 2008, I reported at the uh, EAO symposium, again, the placement protocol for sensitivity and specificity looking at a cutoff value of 55. And you can see that with sensitivity, it was measured at 0.85 and specificity 0.5, indicating a good evaluation as far as the cutoff number of 55. When we looked at loading techniques, again, it stood out quite clearly that the cutoff value of 55 uh, did indeed pick up uh, some of the uh, true, rather, the true uh, false positives, uh, where you can see the survival of uh, implants, uh, with, even with traditional loading, uh, was quite low. So looking at the uh, scale, uh, the actual uh, area under the curve, as we call it, the cutoff value of 55 for loading protocol uh, was uh, sensitivity 0.96 and specificity 0.52. Again, improving, I think, on the predictive value uh, of the cutoff number of 55. Now, in 2010, we looked at those numbers again and to try to uh, get to an even more uh, predictable ISQ number. And we looked again at one staging versus two staging, early loading versus traditional loading. So with this evaluation, we looked at 713 implants at the time of placement. 425 were placed in the maxilla, 288 in the mandible. Of the implants that were analyzed for loading, uh, 1,257, Again, the majority of those implants were placed in the maxilla. Uh, 556 were placed in the mandible. 
And what we looked at was the receiver operating characteristics, in other words, the uh, true value of that statistical analysis. Uh, we tried to identify what we call the optimal RFA cutoff value. And looking at the area under the curve, again, remember that any uh, measurement resulting in a 0.9 to 1 uh, was considered an excellent evaluation. 0.8 to 0.9 was good. 0.7 to 0.8 was fair, and so on and so forth. So in 2010, what we looked at was this area under the curve and identify a specific cutoff number of 56 for the placement protocol. Again, you can see that specificity uh, dropped down to 0.83 and sensitivity went up to 0.53. So with one stage placement, what we were looking at were these numbers again and evaluating the predictive value of a cutoff number below 56 and a cutoff value above 56. And again, you can see the uh, significant results that were uh, obtained by increasing that number from 55 to 56. Uh, and it was different for the maxilla versus the mandible. And as you can see, there was a bigger swing or change uh, with the mandibular um, analyses versus the maxilla. When we combine all of it together, we see that an ISQ value below 56 resulted in a survival percentage of 86.7. However, with uh, a number above 56, that implant would provide us with a survival rate of 98.8 .8 with one stage placement. Now, when we look at two-stage placement, again, here are the values. Under 56, 100%. Above 56 was not as good as far as the values were concerned, 96%. Uh, in the maxilla, it was the uh, reverse. So, as we always say in statistics, you can kind of throw the numbers together and uh, come about with a result that would uh, support your, your position. And that's what we did. We combined the, the, the values and came out with a 96.6% um, .6 survival with ISQ numbers below 56 and 98.1% uh, survival with ISQ greater than 56. And this is for two-stage placement. And the benefit of this is that what we're doing is we're able to follow our patients for a longer period of time uh, and therefore we're able to see or pick up um, uh, failures that occur uh, out long term. So with this new cutoff number of uh, 54, we see that the, as far as loading is concerned, the specificity is again up to 0.95 and sensitivity has dropped down to 0.48. As far as early loading, uh, again, we saw the similar type of response uh, with our um, ISQ value cutoff number of 54. Um, again, combining the two, you're seeing 86.7 and 98.6 when the cutoff value was 54. Now, a lot of numbers here, but uh, it's going to lead up to the uh, discussion that I have for you after this presentation of uh, um, statistical analysis that indicates to me what we need to do when we see an ISQ value. So with traditional loading, when you compare or combine the two um, maxilla and mandible, you see that with a cutoff value of 54 now, uh, the survival rate is 82.6 and uh, with a cutoff value above 54, it was 98.8.9 uh, for traditional loading. From that, the conclusion was that the RFA is a reliable method for determining placement and loading protocols. At that time, in 2010, our cutoff value for placement was 56. That will 
help me to decide whether I can one stage the implant or bury it and um, allow for a healing period. For loading, the cutoff value was 54. The RFA strongly predicts implant survival regardless of the implant being placed in the maxilla or mandible. And with two-stage placement, the survival for implants with ISQ values below the cutoff uh, was almost as high as implants with values above the cutoff. Again, indicating or supporting the fact that when, what we saw in the um, uh, 2008 report, uh, implants at highest risk for failure were thus given the opportunity to integrate undisturbed when we buried that implant. So the same algorithm uh, was used and basically all we did was change the number or the cutoff value uh, from 50 to 54 for individual units in the completely edentulous cases and 56 uh, if we were going to consider immediately um, uh, loading uh, with an attachment. Again, we continue to use the Hounsfield's measurements for, for the partially dentated, uh, along with the cutoff value now of 54, if we're going to two-stage. If we're going to consider one-staging, we would uh, use the Hounsfield's measurement, uh, again, with uh, ISQ values between 54 and 56. And finally, uh, we have to achieve an ISQ value of 56 or higher if we're going to consider immediate provisionalization. With a single missing tooth now, uh, we, I have found that the insertion torque value really doesn't lend to uh, predictability, so we're uh, limiting our evaluation now to just the use of the ISQ number. Uh, with less than 54, I would two-stage it between 54 to 56, uh, staging with a healing abutment and then greater than 56, immediate provisionalization. So, giving you kind of an uh, advanced look at what we're going to be presenting uh, at the uh, 28th Academy, uh, uh, Academy of Austin Integration meeting uh, coming up in uh, 2013, we looked at the same numbers again and tried to even develop a further, um, uh, more substantive uh, cutoff value. So here we had a few drop out from the initial study. So there were 703 implants reported on for placement. Again, the majority being placed in the maxilla and now 1,254 implants for loading purposes. So again, a few of our patients have dropped out of that study. We're looking at the same type of receiver operating characteristics. And here, as you can see, with one stage placement, uh, a total of, uh, out of a total of 439 implants, 11 failed for a survival rate of 97.5% while two staging it. Uh, six failed out of 258. Again, very similar uh, survival rate results for a combine of uh, 97.6. And when we look at the uh, loading characteristics, again, with early loading, four failures occurred out of uh, 406 implants for a 99% survival uh, versus traditional loading, 98% uh, survival with 17 failures, combined for 98.3% survival. Essentially, what this means is that it's a continuum that we're seeing. And if we look at these cutoff values and the survival, uh, you can see that we're getting increasingly closer to identifying a cutoff value if you want 100% survival of 67. Now, when we look at uh, the loading group, Again, looking at sensitivity and specificity, we're seeing, again, the 100% uh, range at an ISQ cutoff value of 67. So what we're hoping to present there uh, at the 28th annual meeting 
is that the, again, RFA value is a reliable measurement for implant stability and correlating that implant to survival based on loading and placement protocols. The increasing ISQ values correlate to increasing sensitivity in detecting an implant failure. Uh, all implant failures occurred at ISQ values below 50, uh, 66 at placement and 67 for loading. In the placement group, implants with ISQ values less than 50 showed higher survival rates with two staging versus one staging. So what we're trying to achieve is really a cutoff value uh, with high sensitivity, uh, minimizing false negatives, and implants with ISQ values below the cutoff can survive if you take appropriate measures. So the Uh, this was the video that was supposed to be uh, played. I'm sorry um, for this uh, technical problem. Uh, the canine here has to be removed because of uh, internal root resorption, and the patient was becoming symptomatic. And again, this patient's demand uh, was for a uh, immediate uh, crown to be placed because of the uh, location of this tooth being in the aesthetic zone and her needs to uh, see her clients, her patients. And so with the removal of the canine, uh, the goal is to minimize trauma to the site, uh, minimize soft tissue reflection so that we are able to um, uh, maintain the connective tissue that is present around this tooth. And so you can see the gentle removal of the canine. And here you can see uh, no internal resorption, but on the other side, as you'll see here, uh, right at the cervical margin of the root, uh, the uh, internal resorption that was occurring. So we want to make sure that uh, any of that granulation tissue that is responding to the uh, internal resorption is removed, and the preparation of the implant site. Uh, for me, the goal to achieve stability or initial stability of that implant is uh, starting the preparation or the osteotomy along the palatal shelf or palatal vault. And as you can see, going through the preparation of the site, uh, the second key for uh, early or initial stability is creating that shoulder with your twist drills so that the implant, when it's placed, uh, is able to be uh, secured onto, again, that palatal shelf. And as you can see, we're preparing it with a tapered twist drill uh, and then further uh, preparing the site now with the drill extension because the handpiece was hitting the adjacent tooth. Now, when I remove the handpiece and you see that twist drill stays in the site, uh, you know you'll be able to establish uh, appropriate and proper initial stability. Uh, here I'm just measuring the defect uh, and proceeding to add uh, augmentation material uh, specifically out to the labial. Uh, this is an alloplast material. Uh, any of the uh, alloplastic graft materials will do. Uh, once I have grafted the labial, I'll take the twist drill and place it back into the site so that I, when I'm further grafting uh, along the cervical margin, uh, I don't push this material down into the prepared site. So once I'm done uh, augmenting, I'll remove the uh, twist drill and place the implant in directly. This also uh, helps to avoid compacting the uh, graft material into the inner uh, aspects of the implant. Again, I typically insert this at about 35 newton centimeters and I'll let the handpiece come to a full stop on its own right there before finalizing the seating or the positioning of that implant. I like to uh, seat the implant no more than three millimeters below the margin of the gingival tissue. Here we're taking our ISQ measurement and as you can see, 
the number of 73 indicates a very good initial stability, and I feel confident that uh, my prosthodontists will be able to provisionalize. So we put in a, um, a permanent abutment, uh, seat it, and then when we go to tighten the abutment screw, you want to put counter rotation on this because at the initial placement, you don't want to over torque and perhaps loosen or seat that implant deeper. And so I'll hand tighten the abutment screw, take a hemostat, and give uh, some resistance to this torque of the abutment screw. Because the one thing you do not want occurring when you're provisionalizing is that abutment screw loosening with time. Uh, because, as was pointed out already, um, the critical period, I feel, and I agree with uh, our previous speaker, that um, the critical period is really the first four weeks. So now I complete the augmentation uh, procedure by uh, using a collagen-based matrix. This is called a plug uh, around the uh, neck of the implant. And to avoid... Uh, causing problems with the suturing uh, for my restorative uh, referral, I'll just throw a uh, horizontal mattress suture on the mesial, uh, as you can see, and then a horizontal mattress suture on the distal. Uh, that way they'll be able to apply the provisional restoration. Uh, just completing the suturing. and then going to the distal. Now you can see the collagen matrix absorbing the blood, uh, therefore helping us to stabilize the blood clot, especially around the cervical margin uh, of the uh, restoration that will be placed. So we'll finish suturing, and if there's excess collagen material, it's okay because uh, it will uh, resorb over time anyways. So now you can see the contours and marginal adaptation of the gingival tissue uh, around that implant that is just placed and the effect of the uh, augmentation. This was a patient one week later uh, for follow-up and you can see the healing progress uh, is uh, uh, undisturbed and proceeding adequately. At four months, I'll go ahead and remove this provisional restoration and remove the abutment. Again, I feel that it's critical not to disturb this entire uh, area uh, as it's going through the healing process. This is the contour of the provisional crown. You can see the maturation of the soft tissue. And here, when we remove it, again, apply resistance with a hemostat uh, as, you, as you're loosening the abutment screw. Again, because you're not sure where the healing process is with that implant. It could be progressing very nicely or it could be uh, heading into the da danger zone. And so the initial measurement, as you saw, was 73. Uh, now at four months, we'll take a second reading and it goes to 79. That tells me two things. Number one, osteointegration is proceeding and that implant is holding up to whatever forces that are generated uh, on that uh, implant during function. And so we go ahead and seat the abutment back in, again, torque tightening it with a resistance, uh, counter resistance, uh, up to uh, now uh, 28, 30 newtons centimeters of force. And again, this is a, uh, quite an easy matter to perform. And as you can see, it really takes less than 10 minutes from start to finish to take that second measurement. And it's a valuable measurement to take because again, it allows you to track or follow uh, the rate of integration that is occurring. Now here you can see for follow-up at six months for the third ISQ measurement. Now here, if integration hasn't occurred, uh, we're in trouble. So uh, as you can see, we did not need to use the counter resistance. Uh, the third measurement, 
Remember, it went from 73 to 79. Um, it was 81. So you can, again, appreciate the fact that successive ISQ measurements allows you to uh, evaluate the um, progression of stability uh, with that implant. And at this point, uh, we will seat the abutment for the last time, therefore torquing it up to uh, 32 Newton centimeters, and then referring the patient over uh, for the definitive restoration, which you see here. And obviously, uh, with the successive measurements, uh, the patient is awake, uh, no anesthesia is necessary, um, and we uh, are able to uh, provide our restorative doctor with a um, uh, definitive recommendation. So the importance of taking ISQ uh, measurements initially and then successive ones is that it establishes a baseline value for comparison to additional measurements after a healing period, additional subset of data or information to assist the clinician in determining the loading protocol. It confirms the phase of biologic osteointegration or lack thereof. It's a mean of communication with the restorative doctor as to when to proceed with the definitive prosthesis. And I would like to remind all of you remaining in the audience that the ISQ number represent a scale or a continuum and it's not an absolute number that uh, we need to, to try to identify. So with that, I thank you very much. <laughs>